Welcome to the Police at End Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Scott Nerney. We are here this evening with Aaron Gukan, Republican Lieutenant Governor candidate in a primary battle and heading on to the general election. If you're successful, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, give us a little background of yourself outside of the political race. Well, I grew up in East Greenwich. Uh, okay. I went through public schools. I've got an older brother. Um, both of us were athletes. We both played in college. Uh, I played basketball in college at Connecticut College and um, went to the NCAA tournament, which was nice, in, in Division III. And, uh, my parents were high school sweethearts. They went to Hope High School and, nice. and uh, they met in middle school. And um, my father is a retired local 51 plumber. My mom is a retired respiratory therapist. So, um, you know, when I, I always kind of joke that when my I complain to my dad or my mom. They always say, "Get up earlier," <laughs> and uh, and that's that's true. You know, get up and grind. Um, so uh, that's kind of what's been instilled in me. It's one of the reasons I'm running. Um, I think accountability is getting lost, and uh, I'm here for the working class. I think um, there's the working class and there's the non-working class, and I'm not talking about the people that are most vulnerable. That's what government's for. But I think that uh, the working class is really, um, people aren't speaking up for them. It's one of the reasons I'm here, because I think they're getting um, taxed, feed, and it's, it's just been a really tough go, especially with energy prices. Um, but in regards to my qualifications, I went to Connecticut College, I majored in music, I got certified to teach modern government and learn the language of German. I then went on to the Eastman School, which is a conservatory. Most people know Juilliard, if Juilliard's the Harvard. Sure. Eastman School, George Eastman, the founder of Kodak, is Yale. And uh, I, I just love my experience there. I went on tour. I sang down south and in, in Italy. And I started to get a little pain in my Achilles from basketball. And I came back and I got surgery. And I was going to go right to New York City and 9-11 happened. So I taught a couple years in North Kingstown as a music teacher. And uh, that summer, uh, I started driving a guy named Don Kachiri and Sue Kachiri, and, and they were the, uh, they weren't, he was not the endorsed Republican, because it was Jimmy Bennett at the time. And um, we, we won the election, or he won the election, and, uh, and then I became his special assistant uh, for two terms. Um, after that, I, I uh, went into banking a little late and uh, rose to vice president within five years and got an MBA at night, so it's two master's degrees. And, uh, and then I went to the Rhode Island Foundation and I did five years there fundraising. Um, you know, it's our oldest and largest, one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the country. It was founded in 1916 and it has about approximately over a billion dollars in assets, all for charitable purposes. So I was very proud to be in that organization. Uh, I raised in the, the eight and nine figures sometimes, a very complicated transactions, estate transactions, wires. And, um, and so I think that that's one of the reasons I'm running because qualifications matter in this race. If you're gonna be a heartbeat away or an elevation away from the governor's office, uh, you better know money, you better know finance. Uh, you, you should have a lot of experience you know, when I was the vice president of a branch, I managed people. All of these things come into play. Uh, I was the chairman of the Works Sewer Authority. Uh, I was on five boards at one time before I went to the Rhode Island Foundation for Nonprofits. So all of that, all those qualifications and education, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm standing up for Rhode Island and saying, you know, I want to run here. So uh, that's sort of me in a nutshell, quick synopsis. Yeah, no, I think it's important that you've you've come from something you've been in the working class, you've been in the public sector teaching, you've been in business, understanding finance, understanding managing people, understanding managing what I would say is a massive budget with the Rhode Island Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a small token dollars, you have to manage what's coming in, what you have and what's going out, and there's a, a lot of people grasping that you have to make decisions. On. Yeah, and I was a fundraiser. so. Uh, Neil Steinberg, everyone knows him, he's, he's the outgoing CEO, I mean, what a smart guy, what a mentor, uh, and he, and you know, the great thing about Neil, he was tough, but he was fair, and, and a lot of times when you have to make those tough decisions, you know, you need a mentor like a Governor Kachiri or Neil Steinberg or Joe Maccarell, who's a former CEO and chairman of the Washington Trust, all these people that helped me 
you know, become the man that I am today. And speaking of that, my wife is a professor at Johnson & Wales. She's also homegrown. She went to LaSalle. Uh, went to Syracuse and got her master's out in California in technology and website design. So she's been teaching at uh, Johnson Wales for over 20 years. And I have three daughters, one of whom just went to Johnson Wales as a freshman. She graduated from East Greenwich High School, and my other two daughters are at Cole Middle School in East Greenwich in eighth and sixth grade. So um, I just, uh, you know, a family guy, and uh, but with uh, a lot of emotion because of the, gr the girls. <laughs> sure, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so one of the big things that a lot of people talk about is, you know, except for if we, if we rewind, and most conversations I have with people is we forget the last two years because of COVID, but let's say we forget the last two years when mm -hmm. Gina Raimondo left. Everybody would say, think back to the cool moves, lieutenant governor's a waste, let's just get rid of the job, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we've seen how important it is mm -hmm. and how it really needs to be more of a partnership versus what it was, where it's two separate offices, the governor does everything, and that other person is just there. Um, yeah. The stuff I've read on you says that you want to be part of the solution, you want to be helping. Uh, talk a little bit about how you can interact and, and apply knowledge that you have to a position that doesn't have authority but has responsibility. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, imagine a lieutenant governor's office um, that has a help center and helps people navigate through the state system. So when I was, you know, the eyewitness of power to the governor, uh, the lieutenant governor was Charlie Fogarty, and Charlie actually ultimately ran against Don uh, or Governor. Because I used to call him Don now because people get confused because sure, no, he's okay. been a few removed. But um, you know, I think a lot of the lieutenant governors in the past they try to tackle, let's just say, health care, education. And to me, it's a little bit preposterous. It doesn't mean that their heart wasn't right. It doesn't mean that it's no negative sell on them. Right. But I think what you can do is you can advocate for small businesses in a way that for the small stuff, which has become a big thing. So, for example, right now, you know, with the Cuisid Inn, I've, I've met or I've eaten at many restaurants and diners across the state. And if you see, you know, across the bar or behind the counter, you'll see all these licensing fees. And... What's happening right now is there's so many licenses that the restaurant business and, and bar business has to go through, and it's all in paper. So every other month they're getting a different you know, note from a different department, right, asking for a fee with a separate username and password if they even have that. And so it's archaic, it's antiquated, and it's, it's time consuming for that small business owner. So what I think is, why don't we take some of the information, right, get a single uh, sign-on, one username and password for all departments, and try to expedite and streamline these processes. So, you know, uh, Jell's down the street, Angelica, uh, that diner, I was talking to her, and she def every other month she's got a different, she has her bills, she has her licenses, and she gets confused sometimes, or she forgets her username and password, and it's just so frustrating. So why couldn't you just have one bill with all the fees, whether you agree or disagree with them, and the, the business owner can just pay them all at once, and or if they're a new business, do it quarterly. So it makes it a little easier. Or for those, let's just say, the startups, you infuse them, incentivize them, and help them. And I think that's another word that's not used enough, is to incentivize. Um, I'm pragmatic. You know, I'm a down-the-middle person. You know, we have some extreme parts of our parties right now and everyone wants to talk about national right now. I want to talk about what's happening locally. I think in addition with our long-term health care, which is also under the statute of, you know, or under the hood of the Lieutenant Governor's office, specifically Alzheimer's. Um, my mother-in-law died of Alzheimer's. It was like a bomb went off on our family. Um, and even, even I came from government on some, you know, for about a decade. I still had problems navigating the state system with my wife's family. And if I'm having problems, then what's the, the normal person, the normal citizen out there that's never really interfaced with the, the state? So it, whether it's resources with 501c3s, we have great state workers. It's not the state workers, but sometimes it's connecting you know, that citizen with that person in the back office to make it easier. You know, I'm part of the sandwich generation. We have older people, we have our kids. 
And when something like Alzheimer's hits a family, it's crushing. And the stress is so high. Like I, I saw a few of my friends just ironically uh, in, in Dave's market. And it was like they come up to me, they're crying, they don't know what to do. And two phone calls, it might take me, it might take them six to eight weeks. And another thing I think it's critical is um, our nursing homes. You know, one in four of our residents in Rhode Island by 2030 is going to be 65 years or older. And we have a problem right now with, with our supply chain of, of CNAs, nurses, and, and we need to incentivize them. I know the governor and, and the legislature passed something um, in, the, in the last session for 500 to 1,000, but I think we need to do more. Um, and also, uh, you know, our doctors, no one wants to talk about the doctors. You know, my friend, who's a surgeon, decided to go to New Hampshire because he, he knew he was going to leave 20% of his career earnings on the table. So they're losing so much, and it's a brain drain, not only in nurses and CNAs, but doctors, because they know if they go to a different state, they're going to make a lot more money. Hmm. And um, if we don't start attacking that now in Rhode Island, um, we are already at a crisis. But I think we'll be a crisis of epic proportions in, in just you know a few years. So these are some of the things I want to do as Lieutenant Governor and tackle emergency management we can talk about a little later in the interview. Sure, and I think you know, when people say incentivize, it doesn't always mean putting cash on the table. Correct. Making things easier for businesses, I think that's the number one thing that, when I've interviewed people, the businesses want to be fast, easy, reduce staff of taking care of things that they shouldn't be. Correct. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit about staffing right now. I don't know if you can walk 200 feet in Rhode Island right now without seeing someone upset that they can't hire enough people. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's everywhere, from the, the fast food to the restaurants to manufacturing. Unemployment is three, depending upon when you're listening to this, three-ish percent. Mm -hmm. um, great that everybody's going back to work that wants to work. I don't think it's a underemployment situation where some people just left the job market. We know some have, mm -hmm. but where are we going to get the people to do the jobs in the United States? Well, I'm glad you touched on manufacturing because as I've gone around the state, I've, I've toured a lot of manufacturing companies and, and um, you know, touching on my dad, I think the average age of the plumber is going to be in like mid to late 50s. Sure. If uh, I, I went to Takeo down the street in Cranston and they're saying that in the next five years, a big part of their workforce is going to retire. Yep. And I think one of the biggest problems right now is we don't have shop in our in our high schools anymore. Uh, and it, it's, it's, when I grew up in middle school, you know, I, I was a musician, so I was in the band, but most people had to do the home ec in, in the shop and start working, looking at blueprints, getting underneath the hood of a car, um, doing woodwork, whatever it was. And, and that provided a pathway for students not only to, to work on their normal core subjects, but to also work on these, these you know, uh, the, the you know, for work for working with your hands, mm -hmm. and so when I talk to the, there's not enough machinists. It takes about at least at least five years, probably ten years, to become a good machinist. I know for a journeyman, uh, it takes five years in the union, and so. But why not get a jump start with these kids? Because I remember, you know, when I was a 14 year old boy, all I was thinking about was pizza, you know, playing basketball, whatever. But it has to, the resource has to be right in the school, and yes, I know we have Davies and. and and PCTA uh, in, uh, in Providence, but most boys and girls won't actively ask their teacher, can you send me to these schools? They're just going to go through the school and not get access to that. So I think that's number one that I would advocate for, um, for education specifically in regards to that supply chain. Um, and then in addition, I think we just had a lot of people retire all at once during COVID. My father was one of them. So was I. And, and I think that especially that age group, you know, the baby boomers, um, their houses are paid for. I think a lot of the younger generation might have moved back. Even the generation that might have had one child, two kids, they all went under one roof and consolidated, not only for safety purposes, but for financial purposes. And then when they threw this bomb of money on the economy and they made it so easy for I think a lot of people paid down a lot of credit card debt. They also saved money. And um, 
and then it, it got a little too easy. And I think right now we've got to, even though we had such an extreme time, we've got to get back to the middle. We've got to get back to economic prosperity. We've got to get back to, um, you know, from this far left thinking where everything's a giveaway. <laughs> it can't keep going. It's unsustainable. It's unmanageable. We have to get back to like the basics of our economy and how we've succeeded as a nation. And I think that's really great to hear. Um, there's been a lot of money into the government in Rhode Island, the over a billion dollars of COVID money, 800 million of overtaxed money that is in a surplus. I have to expect that this coming year is going to be another massive surplus because there's so many people working that I would love to see what what we're going to do about it to try to refill the, the job market because... Yeah, well, the Rhode Island Foundation, they came out with a report, a lot of great suggest suggestions. Um, I think, again, we have a lot of good legislators. You know, I think it's easy to say, oh, the General Assembly, oh, they're all bad, and, you know, especially in the political time. Um, you know, I, I, I know them personally. They're working hard. Yes. But there is this portion of of legislators that are that, that I differ from politically massively. They're way to the left. Um, some of them are almost communists. Or they 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 say they're communists, or they might say that they're what. However, they try to convey their political beliefs. But um, with the rise in inflation came the rise in tax revenue. And so why some of that money wasn't immediately put back into our small businesses, maybe to help innovation, um, do public-private partnerships, work, work with our universities, things of this nature, like work with the blue and the green economy that they talk about. Um, sitting on that money, I think, is sort of arrogant because, you know, all you have to do, I was in Providence, um, I was giving away some food, and there was this woman that was a CNA, ironically, and she, she said, this is the first time I had to come and get food because I can't afford it and I'm working six days a week. And a CNA is, is probably making about the same amount as a person in a restaurant or a gas station. That's nothing negative about a person that's working hard in a gas, but a person with that type of skill level and taking care of our loved ones mm -hmm. uh, needs to get paid a little bit more. Maybe if they stay there for two years, they get $10,000 to go to grad school to become a nurse. You know, these types of programs, which I think you can use these monies that we're sitting on and try to help people and you give them a carrot rather than just a handout. Right. Because if, you, if we don't do that, I mean, it's just natural, right? You want to the work the least if you can, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So one of the things that people continue to be myst mystified by Rhode Island is we have a, a largely democratic legislature, but we love to think about having a Republican governor or a lieutenant governor. Yep. So can you work with a democratic governor if one is elected? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can. Um, I think there's a natural... You know, I think we got to get back to the days where there was Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, you know, the Speaker of the House in Massachusetts and obviously President Reagan, where after the political season, they got together and said, let's get to work. Let's roll up our sleeves for our citizens, and in that case, the United States, but for the citizens of Rhode Island. And then there's always a time where it's like, all right, you know, now we got to go our political ways. Sure. But look at the opportunities, especially with four years, where, especially with my help center, where I can actually not only take these frequently asked questions and start to help and hopefully manage up to the legislature and, and the governor and say, hey, this is what I think is going on, but, but also grabbing that data and managing up with data rather than hearsay. And I don't think that's done enough. And if, if I go around and really use, you know, it's a $1.2 million budget. It's eight full-time employees that will be serving under me when elected. And, and if you get Rhode Islanders, or in people that are specialists in their field that are able to take on with answering the phone, right? And and actually taking people through a beginning, middle, and end, you know, we can really be successful. And yes, I, you know, I know all, I'm pretty I know everyone personally that's running. Doesn't mean everything's gonna be perfect with every relationship. Sure. But I do believe that um, um, you know, no matter who becomes governor, that I have a, a personality that people know. 
that people trust, and it's not a gotcha game. You know, I'll tell you how I feel before I get to the camera, um, because I don't like that, and I know that they wouldn't like that. So if I, I disagree with them, I'd rather disagree with them behind closed doors and then present it, rather than just, and I see this a lot in Washington, where people just run and tweet, and the resentment and the refeeling just comes and it just becomes toxic. And that's what, not what government's about. It's about the people and helping the people and serving the people, not trying to control the people, which is another thing that I think has happened a little too much during the uh, COVID time. So you think the governor's position is more uh, leadership for the people, but lieutenant governors, you see it as more leadership with the people. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great way to put it. Um, Feel free to use that as a slogan. Yeah, well, well, hey, I've done more. I know I'm speaking a lot right now because I'm getting okay. interviewed. Yeah, sure. But I, people say, oh, how did you get your platform? It's by asking questions and listening. And I think that that's something that's not occurring enough. Um, people are hurting right now. And if you just got out of the state house and went into the markets and different things like I do naturally, uh, you got a lot of hard working people that are very, very frightened about our electricity bills, our natural gas bills, our oil bills, and there's this crunch. And I just don't think enough people are advocating for, again, that working class that are trying, like my parents, my mother who was working two shifts, uh, double shifts for 16 hours on the ER. My father, who was working at a job and then maybe at night fixing the neighbor's, um, you know, a toilet or something, and I would hold the flashlight, as I always joke, but it's true. And I think as a lieutenant governor, when you're the governor, you're working on so many different policy things and so many, you can't really get into that real small details and really kind of listen and help, even though they want to. It's too big a job. You're the head of state. But if I can work with that governor and, and talk to them about some of the small things that are really tripping up our small businesses, our nursing homes, and our emergency management, then we can be really effective and really move this state forward, and that's why I'm running. And I think one of the things that you've, you've kind of walked through a couple times, and I just want to remind some of the older voters out there that may be retired and thinking one way or the other with the lieutenant governor position, you're talking about the working person, but I'd also just kind of remind people that a retired person is still in that group, in my opinion, oh, yes. because not only they may have a part-time role, a gig like, like I do, um, they may be on Social Security, most likely, or so, also maybe some kind of pension, mm -hmm. and in many cases, fixed income. fixed income or barely moving income, always lagging inflation. They're trying to manage their money for how long when they talk to their financial advisor to say, well, you can live till 75 is not a great answer to hear when they hoped 85. Uh -huh. So all of these things that you're saying, which, you know, the, the electric, the gas, the, you know, just everyday needs, it affects everybody. So even the elderly generation really needs to look at what your platform is because you're working for them as well. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that our seniors, they are the workers, right? They worked for the 40 or 50 years and have an expectation of what they put into a pension or a 401k is going to be there. Obviously, we had massive growth in the last decade, and now it's really come down very precipitously, um, and it's it's been very much a shock. And then what you might have put in, now all of a sudden you're worried. And then, of course, what you're talking about, um, and, and that's another way that you can take some of these monies and kind of take burden off of some of these seniors. I think you've got to work with the, you know, the PUC, the Public Utility Commission. There's got to be a way to take some of that money that we have and infuse it now to help lower the costs. Because if we get a bad winter, um, especially with all these mandates that they've made, um, I think the green economy is great. But we're not there yet. We're close, but we're not there yet. And California is a perfect example. Their grid can't take it. Now they're having brownouts and blackouts. They're saying, oh, don't use the green cars. And it's, it's government trying to um, jump into things that they probably shouldn't get into, in my opinion. Doesn't mean they shouldn't help and support. And I think everyone that I talk to, if there was something where it was a green car, it was $25,000 or $15,000 or whatever it was for the cost, they would buy it. If I could get my whole house green in New England, 
and do it, great. But right now, I mean, there was there was legislation up there for, that was going to try to eliminate all the gas motors for for um, for weed whackers and, and mm -hmm. lawnmowers. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. And what would happen is, and you know what the arrogance of is some of the people that would try to put that legislation in, if you know their daughter or son was getting married and they needed their grass cut, they'd call the landscaper and say, oh, you know, why don't you do that? Now, I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but I've seen it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's, it's, it's for them, don't, let's do these mandates because it sounds good at a, at a tea party. But the bottom line is, is that in New England specifically, it's so difficult to get through these winters. And look just what happened with this this um, this uh, uh, this deluge of rain. You know, if you've got a, a a green vehicle that's doesn't have it's not gas powered, or you're in the winter and you're, it, it doesn't work, not yet. And especially with the cost of the batteries, that's what I don't think people are understanding, or. It makes people, legislators, feel good up there to say, yeah, this is a great idea, but then when they try to execute it in concept to the mass, to the masses, it doesn't work, or it raises prices too much so then they can't afford it. And this is what needs to get out there in regards to, you know, policy positions. This myopic view of, oh, the right and the left, and the, you know, it, it's crazy. There's a lot of people that are just normal, pragmatic, measured, they just want to go to work and have just normal lives. And, and uh, I think right now it's been so topsy-turvy that it's been difficult. And it's one of the reasons I'm running, to, to bring you that pragmatic and measured leader and a person that's down the middle with experience that can say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's advocate for our seniors. Let's try to slow this down. Let's have a press conference with data saying, I don't know if this is a good idea. And that's what a two-party system's all about, and that's what's I think really healthy, and that's right. what our our founding fathers really wanted us to do. Sure. And looking towards the general election, mm. make out of the primary, um, one of the debates, oh. pardon the pun, but the debate of the debates from the Democratic side mm. is the current lieutenant governor is too busy to attend debates, even with a lot of knowledge. Uh, you're wide open to debating. Oh, I'll debate, you know, like it's the old Rocky movie, uh, you know, with Mr. T, anytime, anywhere. I'm very confident in what I believe in. I'll concede a point when I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I, this isn't, in, 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 for me, like a big ego thing. I left a over six-figure a year job. I left the job to run for office because this is how much I'm affected. And I care about my community. I think the lieutenant governor is um, missing in action. I think it's not only for debates, but if you look at um, things that sh uh, she's supposed to chair, committees she's supposed to chair, she's missing meetings, um, or she's not attending meetings. And, you know, more than half a life is just showing up and showing up on time or, you know, early. That's what my father taught me. And I think it's a shame. I think that um, I like her personally. I do know Sabina. Um, but I think that she was plucked out and put into a position that's way over her head because qualifications matter. Yep. And this is in a role that you can just be plucked into. I have a variety of different friends from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, you know, I had a friend, my, my friend that I just went to Connecticut College, her name's Nakia Kelly, Connecticut College, MBA from Fordham, right? Brilliant woman, you know? I just think that right now, you to have a person that I don't even know what she's done in her professional background. It's very light. To have that person to be elevated possibly to the governor's office is something that I hope that the, that the voters can consider, you know, when they go to the ballot box. Yeah, I think the lieutenant governor line to draw on who you pick is a completely different situation this year, and I'm glad for it. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, can that person take over? Right. And the impossible happened. I think the last time it was in history was in 1950, maybe, when um, was it the senator, the Italian senator? He got he, he got elevated. Um, famous, I just can't think of it. But um, at any rate, I mean, it does happen, and who knows? And you know, I hope everything's runs swimmingly, and I'm just working on my help center and taking care of people and managing up, just like I said. But if that happens, or let's just say a person has an, an accident or has that heart attack, doesn't pass away. But maybe for three days or a week or two weeks, you need someone to go in there. 
and then God forbid, let's just say, just right across the street, a station fire happens. You know, I lived that. I was part of that. You can't rush experience. You can't teach experience. I was there at 25 when it, when it all hit, 100 people died. And, and I know exactly like who to call. I know that you work with the adjutant general, who's the head of the National Guard, the colonel of the state police. I know people in this community. I also know that uh, when you, let's get back to healthcare or whatever, I mean, I don't have a lot of background in healthcare. But what I can do is convene a group of experts and show up on time and listen, have people take notes and say, what's the biggest concern you have, and then advocate. And I learned that at the Rhode Island Foundation. Convene, leave your stripes at the door, figure out some solutions, right? I always say there's a two wine limit, right? You wine twice and then try to get, get to work. And uh, it's something that I'm trying to convey in my campaign. And, uh, you know, I hope the people of Rhode Island will, will see me and say, okay, yeah, I, I can see what he's, you know, conveying, and I, or I can hear what he's, he's conveying, and, and hopefully that they'll vote for me, not only a, in the general, but hopefully the primary before. Sure. You've got to win the primary before right. you win the general. I do so, have a primary on September 13th. So you do have a few days left for that in the general. How can people reach out to you to offer some assistance? Well, I, I have my uh, website, Gukian, G-U-C-K-I-A-N, for ltgov.com. That's uh, Gukian, G-U-C-K-I-A-N, for ltgov.com. Or you can just Google Aaron Gukian. I've got some billboards in Providence, uh, uh, Lamar Advertising, you know, right on the highway. got another one going up uh, tomorrow. Got a lot of signs, a lot of, lot of enthusiasm. I've raised about $100,000 in, in 70 days, and, and I put 10000 into this race. And I'm not from money, so it's uh, I'm all on the line. And I felt like you know um, I, I I'm really happy because my daughters and my my wife has already seen this in me. But you know, half measures you know avail us of nothing. You got to be all in in life, and I'm all in for Rhode Island, and uh, and that's why I'm running. Great. I think it's a fantastic platform. I'm really excited to see where you can go with it. And I hope the voters agree as well. Yeah, and if they don't, you know, that's the political process. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of momentum. You know, I was part of it 20 years ago now with, uh, with Governor Kachiri and the First Lady. A lot of people are rallying around me. They're, it's starting that ripple effect. Um, I'm raising the money that's necessary. I'm in the state matching funds, so every dollar I raise now will be matched after the primary. I think that's a great way to incentivize people like me that can't, uh, you know, and there's n nothing negative about people that do write a check to run. You know, that's what the American way is about. They've wor worked hard to do it. But for me personally, it's given me a lift to compete, to hopefully cut through so I can set, tell my message to the masses and hopefully I can sway them uh, come election day. All right. Good luck. Thank you very much for stopping by the Spotlight Series. Thank you very much. Thank you.